I'm we're now recording. Let me get up my script. So welcome to a to Beyond Universal Design for Learning, brought to you by the ACRL University Library Sections Professional Development Committee. We're so delighted to have you and our panelists here today. I am Sam Harlow, she, her, and I am co-chair of this committee. I will be moderating this program along with my colleague, Leanne Romain, my fellow com committee member. This is one of an ongoing series of online programs sponsored by our committee, and I am putting a link to our programming in the chat. Before I introduce our presenters, um, I'm gonna go over a few logistics. This session is being recorded and we will send the link of the video, slides, and any other supplemental documentation to everyone who registered for the program. You can access the slides during the session if you wish to at the link in the chat that Leanne put in there. The total program will run for an hour, including time for questions. Please feel free to add questions into the chat box throughout the presentation at any time. Leanne will be collating them and will be prepared to read them to today's presenters. As you use the chat feature, please make sure you send your message to everyone. You'll have to change the box to everyone, not just hosts and panelists, so that everyone can see what you're asking and we can try to reduce duplication of questions. We will post a link to a brief evaluation in the chat box after the Q&A session. Please take a few moments to give us your feedback on today's program. With those announcements out of the way, I am very happy to start today's program with a brief introduction of our presenters, and then they can more fully introduce themselves as they see fit. Amanda Roth is an instructional technology librarian and has worked in academic libraries providing instruction services to undergraduate students. She is the reference coordinator and instruction librarian for the University of California, San Diego Library. Dominique Turnbow is the instructional design librarian at UC San Diego. She combines her expertise with instructional design and design thinking approaches with nearly two decades of experience delivering online information literacy instruction to create diverse and inclusive learning opportunities. And without further delay, I will hand it over to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and then we can get started. As any of you who've been on Zoom know, it takes a little bit to get all of your windows in the right spot. So I'm just give me a couple minutes to do that. Okay. So welcome, Dominique and I would like to um, say thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to be talking about um, moving beyond universal design for learning as we start to consider how to create more inclusive learning environments. The session will be delivered in two parts. The first part will provide a brief overview of universal design for learning, also commonly referred to as UDL to provide a foundation of review or to review if some of you are already expertise with UDL. And then we're gonna pause for some questions and check in on the comments. And then we're gonna continue with our ideas for moving beyond UDL as we try to strive to create more equitable, diverse and inclusive learning environments. So in our efforts to promote more inclusive learning environments, we're going to pause and acknowledge that the University of California, San Diego, where Dominica are part of that community, is a land grant institution. And we hold respect for the land and the original people of the area where our campus is located. The university was built on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation, um, who continue to be vital members of our local San Diego community. The other acknowledgement that we would like to have is our colleague Gayatri Singh. So we're continuing to do this work in remembrance of her. She encouraged us to think about EDI in our work as an instructional designers. We could not have gone down this path or probably wouldn't have without her collaboration and support. So a lot of this work that um, we are involved in stems from um, her ideas and her spirit and really her giving us a nudge to push our thinking further and really develop um, some online learning tools and objects and tutorials and all of that stuff with a more inclusive and diverse lens. This image that we're looking at that I have on the screen is the three of us getting together for one of our brainstorming sessions in Geisel Library. Gayatri is on the far right, um, and this is probably one of our early ons, like how do we tackle this? Where do we go from here? 
So um, we're going to start with some definitions, and it's really just to make sure that we have a shared understanding of some concepts that we'll be discussing today. These definitions come from the Nielsen Norman Group, and they're defined as the following. So accessibility is focused on ensuring that an interface and technology can be used by people with various abilities. This includes auditory, cognitive, physical, and visual modes of interacting with content. Relatedly, um, you might hear us mention web content accessibility guidelines, which is often referred to as WCAG, the acronym. And it's a standard um, that makes it easier to access technical requirements. So these standards are often treated like a bare minimum checklist of things that a interface needs to um, have in order to be accessible by a wide range of modalities. Um, we're going to talk about universal design for learning. It's commonly referred to by its acronym UDL, and it creates one experience that can reach the greatest number of individuals. So its original adoption was largely driven by effort and cost. So, but over time, it has become a method to address equity, diversity, and inclusion, largely based on its efforts to incorporate accessibility. So it's important to remember that the framework of UDL, which we're going to talk about um, briefly as an overview, as its name implies, is to create one universal learning environment that addresses the needs of the biggest number of learners. So it's really designed to look at a majority approach. While inclusive design, which we're going to get to later in our the second part of today's um, session, really embraces adaptations and variations. So it seeks to bring in marginalized and diverse experiences into the learning. And it's a counterpart to the idea of universal. And it really looks to make choices in the design that in directly incorporate a difference. So it's a little bit of a different focus there from universal to very specific, um, looking at differences that learners might have. So the approach that Dominique and I take regarding the creation of our learning objects and our online learning is to use a multitude of principles and guidelines from various fields and then adapt those to our unique learners. So UDL is one of these principles, and um, but it's just one in our toolkit. So we're going to look at UDL um, briefly, make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and then we're going to look at some of the other things in which we use in order to move beyond UDL and get to that um, more inclusive learning environment. So um, if you're, you might be familiar with the um, representations on the screen, what we're looking at here are the color coding and the images that Universal Design um, uses to put some signposts and some visual aids onto their um, principles. And so um, what you'll see on the left in the first column is kind of this green gray um, color coding um, and it represents engagement, which we're going to look at. And on this little image, it has this like brain and the center of the brain that's little activated when you're thinking about engage engagement. Um, it's often referred to as the why of learning. The next part in the second quadrant of this slide is divided into three parts is um, the representation principle. It's often depicted in this purple and gray color coding. It has um, the brain lit up in this like giant part of it, not the frontal lobe, but the back part. I am not good with biology, so you'll just have to kind of imagine what that looks like. Um, and it's really connected to the what of learning. And then the third principle has this blue and gray um, designation to it, and it deals with action and expression, and it's really the, the how of learning. Um, and that has like more of a frontal lobe brain imaging attached to it. So Universal Design for Learning is a framework, and it was developed by CAST to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how um, people learn. And this is kind of where you get that brain fun function imaging. Um, CAS is a nonprofit education research and development organization, and the UDL guidelines were created to help designers and developers of online learning use a framework that CAS developed. And so it consists of these three principles, engagement, representation, action, and expression. And um, 
it's intended to remove barriers so that learners can, and this is a quote from CAST, access and participate in meaningful, challenging learning opportunities. So that's kind of the overall goal and the intention with this. Um, so we're going to dig a little bit deeper into these three principles moving forward. But you can find detailed information about UDL if you're not familiar um, with it at the CAST website. So the first principle we're going to look at is engagement. And this engagement is about providing multiple means, um, which really has to do with options for learners that foster learner motivation throughout their learning process. And so this really engagement really addresses the why of learning. The engagement principle looks at ways in which to attract learner interest and sustain that interest and motivation to be an active learner throughout the learning experience. So on this slide, we have um, a table with two columns. The guideline for the engagement is listed on the left, and then there's a checkpoint for how a guideline might be applied on the right. So when we're looking at engagement overall, one of those guidelines would be recruiting interest. And this is um, really about giving the learner choice and autonomy, creating relevance, value, and authenticity, and minimizing distractions. So really, you know, on that learner focus to stay engaged with the material. When this is applies, it might look like choosing, letting the learner choose the tools used for information gathering and processing. So how they intake information and how they actually produce information and might turn it in, um, giving the learners a lot of choice in order to keep them engaged in that learning. Another part of this is sustaining effort and persistence. And this deals with providing ways to help learners sustain effort. So keep going, not just getting excited about it and then losing interest halfway through, how to um, you know, maintain that interest. And this might look like providing feedback to a learner that emphasizes the effort or their improvement as a way to um, achieve a standard rather than like on letter grades, you did well, you didn't do well. So really trying to cater to um, some of those intrinsic motivation factors of a learner. And the other one is self-regulation and it's about setting learner expectations, facilitating learner strategies and developing avenues of learner self-assessment and reflection. So this might look like letting a learner choose the sequence or timing uh, for completing tasks that they might be um, engaged with. So notice that the guidelines within engagement are pretty self-centered. They are kind of a dealer's choice sort of experience for the learner. They really speak to that intrinsic motivation for a learner to stay engaged with the material. The representation guideline, um, this addresses the what of learning. It has to do with the content as opposed to um, what one might think about when we use the term representation in an EDI context. So providing multiple means of representation within U the UDL principle means providing options for difference in the ways learners perceive and comprehend information that is presented to them. Um, and so on this slide, we have another table that has that same guideline um, on the left and the checkpoints on the right. And so some of the things within representation would be perception, which is about providing flexible content that doesn't depend on sight senses or hearing specifically. So giving um, a variety so that you can interchange visually or auditorily or using movement or touch. So when you enact this, it might look like allowing users to customize the information, like read something or listen to something or watch a video and just offering um, different types of modalities to interact with the content. Another one of these is language and symbols, and it's about creating a shared understanding. And this might look like those definitions that we gave right at the beginning, where we talk about the definitions and how we're going to um, define some concepts. concepts. Um, and it could also include things like using multimedia illustrations to support the pedagogy. So offering charts or something, if it seems appropriate to help a learner understand the content. And then representation also deals with comprehension. And this is really about constructing meaning and generating new understandings. 
So this might look like providing relevant content or background information when it's needed. Some of these might look like learn more or providing um, additional information if a, if a learner might you know, not get something on the first time. Um, it really is designed to highlight some of the big ideas and relationships to help learners um, create those connections. And again, this representation within the guideline le really leans towards more of that internal information processing on the part of the learner. And the last one that we have in UDL is action and expression. So um, again, we have that you know, same type of table on our slide with the, um, some of the guidelines on the left and some checkpoints on the right. Action and expression is the how of learning, and it is closely related to how learners interact with the learning environment. And this is where some of those web content accessibility guidelines come into play. So providing multiple means of action and expression um, provides options for the way learners differ in the ways that they can navigate a learning environment and express what they know. So some of the ways that these might um, look like is with physical action. It might may be making a design choice to, uh, to allow the entire interface to work with various assistive technologies. Something that is common that we're seeing right now is that um, light versus dark mode to let users decide you know, how they want to actually visually interact with, with the interface. Um, expression and communication. Um, this is really has to do with modes of sharing ideas that help attain the learner's goals. So this might be um, using scaffolding to deliver content as a way to help do that. And executive functioning, which is about developing and acting on plans to make the most of the learning. So with this executive functioning, it might be providing a calendar or signpost to say, at this point in the tutorial, you should be here. Or at this point in our class, I'm, the, I'm working on this assignment, you should really already have this done or plan on spending this amount of time to complete this task. So it's um, some of those helping learners do some of that executive functioning within their own learning. And again, it has that very um, specific look at an internal learner as an individual within these guidelines. So why use UDL? So UDL includes many foundational instructional design approaches, which makes it a good starting point for creating learning environments that speak to the learner through the use of engagement techniques making sure content is relevant and striving for equitable access. For those unfamiliar with instructional design, it is a body of work that looks at the creation of learning experiences and materials in a manner that results in the acquisition and application of knowledge and skills. So it's really about learning and then taking what you learn and applying it to something. So at the end of any learning, a learner would be able to do something. Well, many of the UDL guidelines are based on the sciences that look at the internal individual process of information processing and learning. The practitioners of an instructional design often look at outside variables that influence the learning experience. And so for this reason, instructional design practices can be useful when striving to create inclusive learning environments because they often consider both the intrinsic and the extrinsic factors in a way that universal design for learning does not. So in this table um, we've created um, shows how universal design for learning principles align with some common instructional design approaches. And the approaches we have listed are not exhausted. They're just a few that you know fit that align really well with universal design for learning. So on this um, slide, we have another table. And on the it's got three columns. The first column is the principle, and these are those UDL principles of engagement, representation, and action. In the middle, we have the benefit, like why this is a benefit to the learner. And then we have it aligned with an instructional design approach that's useful. So I'm going to just explain this a little bit for those who might not be familiar with instructional design. So on the first column in engagement, that first role, um, you know, we call it engagement is about that motivation of the learner. And so one of those benefits is sustaining the learner's attention 
attention and interest. Of course, we all enjoy learning a lot more when we have an interest stake in it. You know, so it's about um, some of those feelings of enjoyment can be tied to engagement. And um, the instructional design approaches that align with this would be Gagne's Nine Events by Robert Gagne uh, or the ARCS model of motivation. And both of these look at how to engage learner interest from the start and sustain that interest throughout their learning process. And both of these are internal and external aspects of motivation. So while the UDL principle of engagement might look at things that are more intrinsically um, part of that motivation. The universal design for learning will also consider some of the in extrinsic tools that we might be able to apply in order to keep our learner engaged throughout that process. And for representation, the what of learning, um, the re that's really the benefit there is to develop content that helps learners build on previous knowledge in order to understand and make concepts with you know, understanding of new concepts and to do the thing that they're supposed to learn, right? And so um, some approaches that are um, aligned with this would be the content performance matrix from Ruth Clark, um, which really helps um, instructors and designers clarify what needs to be applicable, like how students are going and learners are going to apply a concept at the end of the learning experience, or the principles of multimedia learning from Richard Meyer. And these are really um, guidelines and approaches on how best to combine aspects of multimedia. So for example, do you include text within an image or do you include text after an image? Do you read aloud text on a screen? All of those guidelines are part of the principles of multimedia learning. And then action and expression, these are really the benefit here is to provide ways for learners to connect with the instruction that are necessary and meaningful to them. Um, and some of the um, principles that align with that, again, are the multimedia learning, um, the way in which learners might express the um, application of what they've learned. Um, worked examples from Ruth Clark. This is really helps with that executive functioning where you highlight and show all of the steps that someone might need to take in order to achieve um, a desired goal or outcome in a process and, or the web content accessibility guidelines, um, which are um, really those technical requirements. So regardless of what abilities you bring to the session, you're able to access in an equitable way all of the content that's being presented. All of this um, instructional design approaches, there's a resource list at the bottom, so you can always get to the slides and then look at some of these things in more detail if this type of um, instructional design approaches interest you to um, develop some more skills. So we have a few more definitions that we want to um, talk about briefly so that we can start talking about equity, diversity, inclusion, and how these ideas um, go together. So through our work, we've come to understand that equity is really about letting all learners um, have equal rights and opportunities, right? So everybody has equal access to everything. Diversity is purposefully including learners with diverse backgrounds in the learning experience. And we would also um, include like in the design experience, like making sure that their voices are part of um, the choices that we make in terms of what we decide and do not decide to include in an in a object maybe. And inclusion is making sure that all learners feel welcome and valued. So really, and inclusion really speaks to that motivation part of, of learning. So when we talk about equity, diversity, inclusion, this is the lens in which we're talking about. And these are the things that we strive for, the equal access, the um, including learners of diverse backgrounds and making sure that all learners feel welcome and valued. Um, so now let's talk about some of the gaps where UDL has so that we can explain the whole reason for needing to go beyond it. Um, so, um, we've added an image here, and it's just a scale with equity and inclusivity being uneven. And the reason for this is that it's because practitioners of UDL often rely on thinking that if we remove barriers to learning by providing multiple ways of engagement, representation, and action, we are creating an equitable learning environment. 
And that's kind of one of the good things about UDL. It does do a good job of striving to create equity. Um, however, UDL's means of achieving equity focuses heavily on providing varying modes of individual-centered learning modalities, rather than design strategies that speak to a diverse audience. So for example, you may provide the learner the option to read content, listen to the audio, or watch a video. And these are multiple modalities that would address areas of engagement, representation, and action and expression within the UDL principles. However, just because you've removed barriers associated with ability and leaned into learner preferences, it doesn't mean you've actually created an inclusive environment where learners feel valued. Nor do the various modalities speak to our definition of diversity. So remember, universal design for learning is about creating a single learning experience that addresses the largest amount of learners, which is a majority. Just because it's universal, you know, when you're creating something for a majority, you're going to leave outliers out outside of that. And so we're really looking at ways in which we can bring those outliers in. And so that's one of the problematic strategies with UDL is that the learner is the driver of diversity and inclusive elements. So while it allows for cultural and ability differences through its various learning modalities, missing from the guidelines are explicit practices for the designer on how to create diverse and exclusive learning environments. So it lacks guidance on the work that a designer or instructor should do to foster culturally relevant learning experience for learners that may be on the margins to feel welcome and valued. And that's really just because of the perspective it takes when it's trying to create a universal um, adaptation for a learning object. So some examples of UDL in practice, lots of times we see checklists like this, and it's very much a task of going down a checklist. So this slide has a checklist from the West Virginia Department of Education for representation. And it has, you know, did we look at perception? Did we make sure that we created text and image and video? Did we look at language and create um, vocabulary and symbols? And remember with language and symbols, when you're creating shared meaning, whose meaning are you creating? Is it you know, top down, the instructor saying, this is what we mean, or is it group created meaning? All of those things need to be considered. Um, comprehension would, is just about providing background knowledge. So it really does can become this checklist approach of, did I meet all these things? Yep, okay, we're good to go. So what we would like to do is actually um, look at ways in which we can move beyond um, that learner-centered look um, that UDL provides. And so this slide, we have the learner represented as a car with a graduation cap pulling the trailer of inclusion, right? And it's because a lack of specificity within the UDL guidelines about how to create learning environments and objects that address our initiatives to include diversity and inclusion in our instructional practices. practices. They rely heavily on the learner making um, these choices and they really become the driver of inclusion. So um, for example, you might create an assignment um, and you let the students select any topic of their choice and create an annotated bibliography. And you might be, you might say you can turn that in via text, you could turn that in with a, some kind of video if you wanted, or audio, you could just read it aloud. And this gives all of the learners, you know, various modalities in which to interact, but it's really up to the learner themselves to offer an expression of their own identity. If they choose to do a topic that is culturally relevant to them, you're putting the um, learner in the driver's seat to reach those initiatives. So UDL lacks the EDI guidance in part because the sciences that provide the foundation for UDL are neurosciences, psychology, and even some of the learning sciences. And they use, uh, they draw heavily from a psychological perspective to understand learners' needs. And these sciences, of course, have their own inherent viewpoints, like being Western Hemisphere focused. Um, they often oversimplify cognition in order to create universal insights that tend to normalize the learning process. And you can kind of see this reflected in their choice of using brain images to represent the different principles and their color schemes, because it really has this like intrinsic information processing approach to it. 
So absence from the UDL guidelines are areas of study that focus on diversity and inclusion from like ethnographic studies. They might highlight the way culture shapes information processing, which in turn creates variances in comprehension and understanding. So we're going to pause because that is uh, kind of a lot to digest. Um, and we're just going to check in and see if there are any quick questions that we can answer before we move on to the next part of moving beyond universal design for learning. So I'm going to just check in with chat and our moderators. Nothing in the chat yet. Okay. Perfect. So you have you all have access to chat there if you would like to use it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, move forward then. So now we're going to present about how we can move beyond UDL and Dominique is going to take um, take over from here. Great. Hi, everyone. So I will take over from here and we'll be talking about uh, moving beyond UDL. But feel free to please put your questions in the chat as we go along if you think of them. And I'm happy to pause even during this part of the presentation if we start to get questions. So the first thing um, that I'd like to highlight that we'd like to highlight about this is that design choices matter. The inclusive research, the inclusive design research center considers the full range of human diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, gender, age, and other forms of human difference. The Nielsen Norman group describes the goal of inclusive design as fulfilling as many user needs as possible, not just as many users as possible. So this distinction is really important. When we design for as many users as possible, we normalize the learning experience and accept the model of development that leaves marginalized individuals in the margins. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to the next slide, Amanda. Oh, I can't hear you. Okay, there you go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. So um, this slide, we're on this slide, we're talking about the power of design choices. Um, we have a table with two columns. The left column has a design choice, and the right has the message to the learner when the designer makes that specific choice. So each design choice is an opportunity to send a message of inclusion inclusion to learners. By choosing culturally relevant topics, you're making a choice to include marginalized voices and experiences in your role as the designer. In contrast, UDL often puts the burden on the learner to make that choice. So again, moving from the sort of intrinsic focus to more of um, a community focus in making design choices. By representing um, BIPOC voices and learning objects, um, it, through their examples, it conveys to the learners that diverse voices are welcomed and heard. Um, the third cell there, going beyond multiple modes of delivery, ensures that tutorials consider ability beyond technical requirements as part of the EDI experience and creates inclusivity for an often forgotten group. For example, if there's a decision tree in your tutorial, the designer needs to imagine the experience of seeing it versus reading a lengthy alt text that explains each decision point. This might pass an, ex an accessibility checker. However, we forget how the user experience is impacted when relying on tab navigation. So that the UDL part would be that it passed the accessibility guidelines and sort of the inclusive design piece is, is what's the experience like for any learner that might need to rely on the technology. Next, using inclusive pronouns and language that are person-centered lets learners know they are respected and seen for the holistic person they are. And finally, providing culturally responsive feedback acknowledges and respects existing knowledge. So now we're going to go into some examples of some of these things that we've used. So use, um, using relevant examples. On this slide, we have an example of general guidelines that might be provided to a learner about how to create a citation with elements like author, years of publication, chapter titles, and publisher information. Below that, we have an example citation using the general guidelines provided. Inclusive design practices will include the choices that go beyond content relevance that highlight diverse voices. Here, the topics and examples you choose will do two things at once be content relevant and uplift diverse voices or topics. In this example, the work is authored by a person of color. So just being very intentional about your examples. 
um, representing diverse experiences. On this slide, we have an example of scenario-based learning that represents diverse experiences, specifically a first-generation college student. The scenario reads, Ramona is a first-generation college student and writing a research paper about Mexican-American health disparities and is unsure about where to start when looking at the library's website. Their assignment requires them to locate peer-reviewed journal articles. Based on the information provided earlier in the tutorial about the difference between a catalog and a database, select the resource from the multiple choice options that would best help Ramona with their research. So by having a first generation college student that may represent some students using our tutorial, we know that it represents actually a, a, a certain percentage of our students. And then also um, it brings in sort of some assumptions that you can make about this um, character's experience, which may include not having access to other people at home that might be able to help the student. Okay, so representation. On this slide, we have two images. In the image on the left, we have an instructor at the front of the room teaching a group of students seated in rows. She is telling them that it is important to check the academic integrity policy of the class. Of note is that the instructor is a person of color and therefore in a position of power. The image on the right includes three examples of characters that we have created for our plagiarism prevention tutorial. They include people of color and those with different body shapes. We enlisted our colleagues to help us with the voice recordings. For example, we had an Asian male colleague do the voice for the Asian male character. So you need to be thoughtful about how you design, about how your design choices reflect your learner population. You can't possibly include all variations of the human experience all of the time. So it's more impactful if it reflects your learner population. So back to design thinking and including your learners in, in the design choices. Language. This slide presents an example of how to incorporate person-centered language. The scenario reads, Review the scenario in which Renita, a medical student, tries to save time on a paper by copying and pasting information from an article. Once you review the details of the scenario, decide whether or not you think they plagiarized by answering yes or no. So many of us are familiar with specifying our pronouns in email or on Zoom, but designers need to also remember to use inclusive non-binary language in learning objects as well. Feedback is a really important place to consider design choices as well. This side, slide includes an example of feedback provided from an incorrect answer to a question. The answer the student selected is, the use of paraphrase and citation is a strategy to prevent plagiarism. Our feedback is, in some cultures, repeating the ideas of scholars in a paper is a sign of respect, and it is a universally accepted practice not to cite the ideas of scholars because the value of their words is culturally accepted. In the United States and at UC San Diego, the practice is to use paraphrase or quotations and a cited reference to distinguish the ideas of scholars from your own. This practice will help you prevent violations of the UCSD policy of integrity of scholarship and identify for your reader, the words of the scholars you may be referencing, referencing and distinguishing your own ideas. The feedback provided should be more than just the correct answer. With the knowledge that about 20% of our students are from China, where students are not expected to always insert their own ideas, we are recognizing how citation is culturally different. There are many other ways to practice inclusivity in your design. You can incorporate design thinking into design practices. The methods offered by this framework, the design thinking framework, can facilitate our understanding of learners' experience with using the library services and collections. This is where we see the biggest opportunities to incorporate the goals of design justice, which centers marginalized voices. Include diversity questions and learning object evaluation forms to learn what resonates with learners and how to improve connecting with them through design decisions about character appearance and examples used. And then finally, you can proactively purchase instructional software or image packages that include teachers and learners representations. We have added a diversity and inclusion checklist as part of the software review before we purchase things. And then we have one practice sort of activity here that we can do if people wanna just chat in. But on this slide, we have a scenario and we were just wondering what you would do to make it more inclusive. 
So the scenario reads, John is writing a research paper for his class in economics about the gender pay gap. He finds an article on Wikipedia that he would like to use to provide background information. He pastes the following passage into his paper. Quote, differences in pay are caused by occupational segregation with more men in higher paid industries and women in lower paid industries, end quote. Because Wikipedia is an open source and can be cited by anyone, he does not cite the source, did John plagiarize? So this could be an example scenario that could be included in a learning object. So feel free to chat your ideas to everyone about how you might make it more inclusive. So changing the pronoun, um, if I miss one, let me know, Amanda. <laughs> So yeah, that's a pretty obvious one. Um, use an expert that doesn't refer to gender binaries. Okay, specify where John is in the US. Change the name from John, a gender neutral name and then gender neutral pronouns. Yeah, those are some obvious things. So of course, um, those are the ones that, that I think are, are most obvious. Amanda, did you have any additional ones? Yeah, so one of the other things that we do with our questions, and this is um, really for um, a variety of reasons, is we would set up the a lot of the times when we have a question that's multiple choice, we're relying on the format to inform a visual learner that you're about to answer a multiple choice question, right? It's like questions and you see three or four answers and it clues in the learner that this is a multiple choice question. So to help with accessibility, but also some of our um, executive functioning issues, maybe around being on the spectrum or having ADHD, we will actually set up the question in a different way. So we would add to this, you know, we are going to ask you a series of multiple choice questions. You will be asked a question followed by a scenario, and then you'll be expected to choose from, you know, two or three answers provided, you know, the best answer to the question. So really adding those directions up at the front before we, you know, just rely on the visual clues that a question is in fact a multiple choice question, we would also add that as well. So not just addressing the scenario, but also the design choices that lead up to that presentation. Thank you. And I would also add that we rarely do yes or no questions like this. Um, we usually, if they are yes or no, we'll usually have yes because no because because we're um, trying to get closer to the application level sort of um, assessment of changes in behavior or understanding of material, which is, as we know, more difficult to do in an online format generally. So um, that's another recommendation. And then of course the feedback needs to be very specific. So to not only um, give the correct answer, but also to recognize any sort of cultural um, differences or other sort of um, inclusion practices that might need to be necessary for your learner population. And we spend a lot of time sort of examining our learner population for any particular learning object so that we can be sure that we're getting as close to that mark as possible with our examples and stuff like that. Okay, so I think, Thank you all for your participation in this very sage on the stage type format. <laughs> um, so we're just now we're at the part where we can take some general questions about what we presented or if you need clarification about anything. I saw some things in the chat that I know we're going to follow up with later, um, but we're happy to take questions now too. So how do you choose culturally relevant topics to use as examples? Well, I think I'll start, Amanda, and then you can piggyback on me. Um, my first, my, like the first thing that comes to mind for me there is we're usually designing for a specific course or group. And so we work very closely with the faculty and we learn um, and we also have experience, usually past experience, working with students enrolled in that course. So we definitely have some ideas about um, what they are thinking about as topics for the course. And then also with um, 
I would say for me through my consultations with students from previous courses, I, I start to get a sense of what the students are thinking about. Of course, that may not represent the exact cohort that we're designing for in that particular quarter, but it's one way to sort of bring in that, that knowledge without having to do a huge usability study, which is, is sort of the other way you can go with that. <laughs> Amanda, do you have anything to add? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes we'll choose, um, like if it's, I don't, you know, like if it's a history class or like, a, um, we might choose a topic, you know, that's geared more towards, um, what the faculty member is trying to, um, purvey, but then add in, like, is it okay if we do this part of history, you know, as opposed to this like Western European type, type thing. So we often ask like, you know, we'd we like to use this, um, this example, is it okay? All of our um, objects usually get a once over look from a lot of different people, st different stakeholders. Um, so by the time it gets published, it's kind of out there and there's not a lot of pushback. Another thing that we might do is just look at things that are popular and happening, you know, currently um, too, because students are often really, oh, and learners are really aware of stuff that's happening culturally in our country and have ideas about that too. So sometimes we'll, we'll take something just like out of the, the, the news and be like, you know, this is something that we're discussing and highlight that as well. So there's a question in the chat or a comment about, and I think it was about the last sort of practice question, instead of just yes, no, ask why. So that's a design decision. Um, we don't have chat boxes in our online instruction tutorials because we need them sort of automatically graded so that we can provide the feedback and we have thousands of students taking them at a single time so that's why we do the yes because the no because and sort of the because part of each response is something that we hear frequently from students as a reason why something um, may or may not work so um it's just consider that when you're designing things online, if you want people typing things in, it's it's really challenging to give them direct um, specific feedback in, in the moment. And you'll also have to review those responses. Um, there's another question about have disciplinary faculty pushed back on any of these changes? I have not had that experience um, with the faculty that we've worked with. And I don't think Amanda has either, but. I'll let you answer now. No, yeah. In fact, I think on one of our iterations, it was suggested that we change out. Uh, it was a position of power. It was the, um, we had several slides where the image had a teacher student scenario and we presented a male teacher and followed by a female teacher. Um, and they recommended that we reverse that order show the female teacher first and then you know a male teacher which was something that uh, we didn't think about and we were happy to include that so um we haven't gotten a lot of, of, of pushback based upon these choices that we make mostly they just want the content to be there you know a lot of this what we choose is up to us so we're really pushing the um forward thinking of being um more inclusive than where the faculty's brains are at so this next question, I think, is something that we have talked about is, do you find a tension between reducing cognitive load and inclusive design? Is it ever a problem to include more text and explanation in pursuit of inclusion, but at the risk of providing more info than someone can take in at once? And we have talked about that, Amanda, and I have talked about that a lot um, in a little bit different way. I'm often feeling like our design decisions come down to engagement versus accessibility, like a, a choice between engagement versus accessibility, which is a little bit what I think this question is touching on. Um, so the way we've handled that in our organization is we have decided to prioritize accessibility. So I, I do think there is that tension and I, I don't want to minimize it. It's big. And for years, we struggled with how we were going to handle it. And we just decided um, we were always going to favor accessibility when it came down to a, a point in which we needed to decide because it truly did feel like everything was coming down to accessibility versus <laughs> design or like engagement really. So Amanda, I don't know if you have something to add to that. Yeah. And I, I mean, a lot of the things that you'll see there, 
I'm going to say like, sometimes you can be really explicit about what you're um, in deciding to include to be more culturally represented, representative. Other times it's more of a passive, like those citations, maybe, you know, we're hoping that um, some of our Pacific Islander students are picking up on the fact that, you know, we have a topic in the citation title that's about the Philippines. And it's a, you know, it's from uh, an author of color, but it's not like an explicit part of the lesson. The lesson is about, can you create a citation? So we why do we do this in both ways, being like really overt in some cases where we're, we can, and then maybe more, you know, passive with our approach in other places, which might be good for those folks in like Florida who have so many challenges with what's happening down in their state in their conversations. So the next question we have, and I'm trying to get to them in order, so we'll do our best, but just know that we will answer all of the questions um, after the fact through the document that um, is being created. So you touched on the tension between making a decision chart accessible, but also consider the experiences of a non-sighted user who accesses instructional content with a screen reader and tab navigation. What are the best practices with the amount of content and information included in alt text? Amanda, I think this is your wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, I just need to look at it. So it's from and... Bridget. Okay. I was listening and my mind was wandering because I was reading some of the other ones. Um, yeah, so with the um, the alt, so first of all, when we decide to use an image, we want to make sure that it's relevant. We never are putting a grumpy cat picture next to anything just because it's cute or we want to fill up space. Like images are really only used if they are adding to the content in some way, shape or form. And then the alt text really needs to describe not just what's there, but why it's relevant. So in some cases, like if we have an infographic or decision tree and we can't think of any other way to um, um, present this information, we'll create a text document, like a PDF document that really, you know, someone would have to read to walk through um, to get the understanding of what that image is. So it's a it's a two part, it's a two part thing thinking, do I really need this image? Um, what is this image conveying? Why do I why did I choose it? You know, like, what is it doing for the learner to actually look at this image or read this? And that's true, also true for videos. You know, like, is this, does it, what does this video do um, for the learner? And then um, alt text is kind of an art onto itself. But um, there's some guidelines online that kind of help you um, write those if you're interested in learning more. Okay, so um, there is a question about sharing URLs. Um, so I just wondered, I'm thinking because we have learning objects in a lot of different formats right now, and I know some are more easily shared than others. So we can definitely think about it and share the ones that we think are able to be shared at this point. And by able, I mean they're you, they're developed in software, which doesn't readily make them able to be shared outside of like say Canvas, because <laughs> maybe they're maybe it's a particular object that we have in Canvas. And also many of them are linked to credit forms that we wouldn't want public. So we would have to unlink those and stuff like that. So thank you for the request and we'll see what we can do. Um, we also have a have a question about if these strategies have been studied or evaluated. Um, so that's a little bit complicated, um, and we say that because um, Amanda and I and Guy Tree, before we started down this path, we actually did try to do some literature review, obviously, to figure out um, what had been published about this. And at the time, there wasn't anything beyond UDL. Everything was about UDL. And we haven't seen a lot of empirical research come out beyond that. So what we've been doing is just within our organization, implementing some of these strategies and then getting feedback from our learners. So so in the sense, like, have they been studied and evaluated in a really rigorous way? Probably not, <laughs> but um, there could be work out there that I'm not familiar with. What has been studied though, like all of the instructional design principles that are integrated into our objects have been studied as effective. Also the ideas of UDL have been tested. So 
individual components have been tested and, and studied and evaluated. And also the idea that um, if people see themselves in learning or in content for learning, that it sparks engagement and a positive, you know, interactions with the content. So I, what I want to say is a lot of individual components have been studied and evaluated, but maybe not necessarily the stuff we're presenting today, because we just haven't done that study ourselves. And we've tried to look for similar studies and especially within the library world <laughs> and because our unique in academia and especially libraries is so different from like the other things that may have been studied in like corporate environments for example so yeah and um sarah that is a question that we sat there with gayatri and talked about you know pretty extensively and that's why looking at our own students like what we could do internally and making sure um, to see if they were impactful for them was really an effort where we tried to put um, all of, you know, all of our work, mostly because as instructional designers, we're always looking at how to adapt everything to our unique learners, right? It's, it's, we often are not looking for a solution that works for everything, for everybody. We're often looking for, this looks great. Now, how can we make it work for us specifically? Because each um, learning environment is gonna be different. Each learner population is different and the needs of, of what those learners look like will be different too. So it's definitely a thought that um, we've thought about and continue to think about um, as we work in this area. So a question just came in, do you sometimes have to choose between adapting accessibility and diversity? My quick off the cuff answer is no. <laughs> I feel like we can do both at the same time. Um, but Amanda, I'll let you answer. Yeah, um, accessibility is really those, you know, if we recall that definition is really those technical aspects. So as long as we can address the accessible needs, we're okay. Now, the one thing about accessibility that sometimes gets overlooked, and this is really a diversity issue as well, is that just because something is technically accessible doesn't mean it works for people with different modalities of interaction, right? And so um, just because technically you can use a keyboard navigation to move around a screen doesn't mean that it speaks to somebody, the experience of someone who actually has to use a screen reader. I think the first time I created a learning object that was accessible, I was so proud of myself. And I went to our Office of Students with Disabilities and I asked someone to review it. And I was so crestfallen after that experience because I realized, although it was accessible, their learning experience was absolutely horrible. Like talk about sinking motivation. Um, so really is thinking about um, being diverse, first and then just making sure that the technical choices make sense and are actually usable. So we have a couple of minutes left and um, Sam has posted a an evaluation. Um, and then, oh, I just saw a question come in. A terminology, a terminology question. Can you talk a little bit more about how you are connecting the idea of learner-centered design with UDL and what ways is learner-centered design as an idea separate from UDL compatible with diversity and inclusion and not only equity? So that's a big question. And I think we might have to, because of the time, take that one to the document and get back to you um, in the document. Would you agree, Amanda? I just don't want to yeah, short yeah. change the answer <laughs> by rushing through. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, yes, I think that's it's the, this one is pretty layered, right? And then not just in terms of the technology, but um, how we would approach it. So we will we will write you a short paragraph <laughs> <laughs> so that we can get this answered. And you're gonna put that in the link to the slides. The yeah, document that you have, right, Sam, where you're collecting the questions? Yeah, we're collecting the questions. We don't typically share those with the audience. So oh, okay. Oh, okay. since this is a flexible presentation, you could sure. add a slide. We can add it to this slide. Yeah, that's a yeah. good idea. We'll okay, so the, the link deck. that you um, will get with your recording will have these slides, and uh, Dominique and Amanda will add in any additional information that they couldn't get through today. Um, mm -hmm. We are right at 2 p.m. Central Time, and I want to be um, fair to ACRL, who have given us an hour of their time. 
Um, so thank you all to our fan panelists for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you to Alois Sharp, as well as everyone in the ACRL office who always helps make this magic happen for these presentations. Remember that we will send the link to the recording and this presentation um, through an email when it is available. It does take um, a couple of days to process. Um, please remember to fill out the evaluation that's been shared so many times in the chat. Uh, sorry, we just have to do it. And um, have a great weekend, everyone. It's Friday, no matter where you are. So thanks everyone. And Lois, I think we're good to go. Sorry, we, we hit right.